Summary of the Laramie Project by Moises Kaufman At the beginning of the Laramie Project, people from the town of Laramie, Wyoming, talk about how great it is. They talk about how close everyone is and how beautiful the town is. After the people of Laramie talk about their town, members of Tectonic Theater Project talk about how their boss, Moises Kaufman, asked them to join him in Laramie, Wyoming, to study a play about the murder of Matthew Shepard, an openly gay college student from Laramie. At first, some people in the theater group were hesitant. They were worried about their own safety and about whether or not it was right to reflect a real community on stage. After some thought and persuasion, however, they did agree to take part. When the group gets to Laramie, the first person they meet is Rebecca Hilliker, who is in charge of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. Rebecca helps them find people to question, and the company uses parts of these interviews, with many people who knew and loved Matthew Shepard, to give the audience a sense of who Matthew was according to the people who knew and loved him. Characters like Romaine Patterson talk about Matthew's megawatt smile, and Doc O'Connor, Matthew's car driver, talks about how honest Matthew is about being gay. The company also uses these interviews to find out how the town felt about LGBT people in general at the time Matthew was killed. Often, these pieces of interviews contradict each other. This makes the reader think about the residents' individual memories and opinions and wonder what is true and what isn't. Some people in the community are very accepting of LGBT people, especially those who are LGBT themselves or have close ties to the LGBT community. On the other hand, many straight people in Wyoming think that the live and let live attitude is accepting enough of LGBT people, even though it forces LGBT people to hide who they are. Many people, especially those who follow more strict faiths, are uncomfortable with the idea of homosexuality. Some even say they don't like it or are disgusted by it. The writers start to figure out what happened the night Matthew was killed by talking to people who worked at the fireside bar. They think that Matthew was alone at the bar drinking a Heineken when he met Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson and went with them at 11.30 p.m. The next morning, a college student named Aaron Kreifels found Matthew badly beaten and tied to a fence, where Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson had left him to die. This shocked Aaron Kreifels. Officer Reggie Flutie came when Aaron Kreifels called 911. He helped Matthew get stable and put him in an ambulance. During this process, Reggie got into Matthew's blood in large amounts. In the emergency room, Matthew was given care, and it became clear that he had brain damage and needed a machine to keep him alive. The company then talks to Matthew's friends, like his friend Romaine Patterson and his academic advisor John Peacock, about how they felt when they heard about his attack. They talk about their denial, fear, and grief. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were quickly charged after they were caught. Aaron and Russell were charged with murder in front of several hundred people. As word got out about their arrest, newspapers from all over the country sent writers to Laramie, where they asked a lot of questions and made a lot of judgments. Matthew, on the other hand, was still in very bad shape. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson both chose to plead not guilty, which made Detective Rob Debris want to work hard to make sure they didn't get off after their trials. Reggie Flutie, a first responder, found out that Matthew had HIV. Since she had touched his blood while helping with the emergency, she was also at risk of getting HIV. In conversations, Reggie talks about her active treatment plan and how worried she is that she may have caught the disease. At the same time, people all over the country held vigils for Matthew. In Laramie, Catholic priest Father Roger Schmidt led one. Interviews with people in the Laramie area right now show that many people are trying to figure out how to deal with their personal and religious objections to homosexuality and their shock at Matthew's death. Some people can't understand or accept that racism played a role in Matthew's attack, so they think the media is using Matthew's death to get LGBT people unfairly special rights. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson's friends talk about how shocked, sad, or angry they are about what they did. Residents of Laramie who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual worry about their safety when they walk alone or show love for their partners in public. 
During this time, members of the theater group also talk to and attend the church services of many religious leaders in the area. Stephen Mead Johnson, a Unitarian minister, feels it is his job to help the community become more open and accepting after Matthew's death. Father Roger, a Catholic priest, organized Matthew's vigil. Doug Laws, a Mormon minister, condemns homosexuality. The Baptist minister thinks Matthew's attack may have been a result of his lifestyle. All of these different faith views show the wide range of feelings that people in Laramie have about Matthew's death. Matthew dies in the urgent care unit with his family around him. He had been fighting for his life for a long time. Rulon Stacy, the CEO of the hospital and a devoted Mormon, cries on national TV as he tells everyone that Matthew has died. Plans are made for Matthew's funeral, and on a snowy day in late fall, the people who come fill two churches and a whole park nearby. Reverend Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church tries to protest the funeral, but his rant is drowned out by a group of people singing Amazing Grace. Six months later, Fred Phelps also protests Russell Henderson's trial, and Romaine Patterson, who was moved by the Amazing Grace singers and is a close friend of Matthew's, holds a counter-protest. Romaine and the other protesters dress up as angels with wings and surround Phelps so they can't see him. Inside the courtroom, the jury is chosen for the hearing. Jurors are asked if they would be willing to give Russell the death penalty, which he deserves because of his crimes. Russell Henderson pleads not guilty at first, but before the hearing, he changes his mind and says he is guilty. He gets two life sentences instead of the death punishment. Reggie Flutie gets the good news that she did not test positive for HIV right after Russell's trial. The play then shows Aaron's court case. Before Aaron's trial, many of the characters talk about how they feel about the death sentence. Since Aaron didn't take a deal to plead guilty like Russell did, he could be put to death. Some people are against the death sentence because they believe that violence is never a good way to stop violence. Other people in Laramie think that Aaron needs to be killed so that justice can be done. As the hearing starts, the play acts out Aaron's statement to Rob Debris that was recorded on tape. Aaron says in the statement that he killed Matthew by beating him and tying him to a fence so he could die because Matthew hit on him. Aaron is found guilty of murder by the jury. Then, Aaron's defense team talks to the Shepherd family to ask that Aaron not be put to death but instead be sent to jail for life. The prosecution chooses to listen to what Matthew's parents, Dennis and Judy, want about whether or not to ask for the death sentence. Matthew's father, Dennis Shepherd, says something very emotional about his son in which he talks about how much he loved Matthew and how he thinks Matthew is with God now. Dennis then tells the public that he and his family believe in the death sentence and that Aaron deserves to die, but that he and Judy have decided to spare Aaron's life in honor of Matthew. Dennis tells Aaron to think about Matthew a lot and be thankful that Matthew saved his life. Now that the cases are over, people in Laramie can think about how the murder has changed their town and themselves. Jedediah says that since the murder, he has become much more accepting of gay people and will play a gay role in a college production of Angels in America. A lot of people feel the same way. Some people, like Jonas Sloniker, are angry that they don't seem to be getting anywhere. In the end, the theater group says many tearful farewells and looks back, then heads back to New York to put on their show. About the author Moises Kaufman was born to Jewish parents in Venezuela in the year 1963. After getting his bachelor's degree in business administration from Metropolitan University in Caracas, Venezuela, Kaufman went to New York City to study theater directing at New York University. After Kaufman graduated from NYU, he and his partner, Jeffrey Lahast, started Tectonic Theater Project. In 1997, Gross Indecency, Kaufman's first play, was put on by the group. Kaufman started directing on Broadway for the first time in 2004 with Tectonic Theater Project's I Am My Own Wife. He was nominated for a Tony Award for directing, among other awards. The National Medal of Arts was given to him by President Barack Obama in 2016. Bess Rowan, a theater researcher, wrote a piece about Kaufman for the book 50 Key Figures in Queer U.S. Theater, which came out in 2022.
Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.